you can't really get away with shitty drums. If the drums suck, they just suck. So yeah. good drum production is such a big part of a great overall production quality that, it, yeah, it's just one of the, the most important things. This is the Self-Recording Band Podcast, the show where we help you make exciting records on your own, wherever you are, DIY style. Let's go. Hello and welcome to the Self-Recording Band Podcast. I am your host, Benedict Tyne, and I'm here with my friend and co-host, Malcolm Owen Flood. How are you, Malcolm? How was your weekend? Hello. Hey, Benny. I'm good, man. I got incredibly sunburnt. My, the back of my kneecaps, or I guess, I don't know, it's not your kneecaps, the back of your knees. <laughs> <laughs> my knees are like the color of like uh, um, a medium rare steak. It's, it's nasty. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's like literally the same color I like to cook my meat, but it's my knees. <laughs> Did you do the, the, like, the pressure test or whatever? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. See how soft it is. It's good. It's good it's to go. Good. <laughs> 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 awesome. Um, yeah, it can happen, especially when you're working, right? It was not. It's not like just so people know. It's not because Malcolm was lying on the beach all weekend. No, it was me standing on a boat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> still um, sounds like was, fun to me. <laughs> it, it was fun. Yeah, it, it was a blast. I, I was working on a documentary. I don't know how much I'm allowed to talk about it, so I, I'll yeah. just kind of say that I was on a boat. Um, but in the <laughs> position of being the sound guy on on a film set, you sometimes can't move like for like an hour you're standing there holding a microphone in place like and you literally just can't take a step so it's just the sun's just hitting you <laughs> reflecting off the water and you can just feel it start to smoke <laughs> <laughs> oh shit yeah you need you need one you do you know these hats with the umbrella on top like <laughs> yeah totally. you need one of those now, i have a sun hat but yeah i can't wear like headphones with it right oh shit um yeah. Now, on the way back, I was like, there's got to be a solution. So I started Googling what other location sound people do to deal with the sun and needing to wear headphones. And there's this super dorky hat that's a sun hat with holes cut in the side where headphones go. Really? And <laughs> yeah, it looks hilarious. <laughs> Highly suggest to Google. Just type in that location sound mixer sun hat. You'll find it. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. And are you getting it? Uh, yeah, for sure. Yep, for sure. Yeah, okay, okay cool. <laughs> All right, awesome. Uh, before we get to today's episode, I wanted to let you know that I have a free 10-step guide for you. The 10-step guide to successful DIY recording. If you go to the selfrecordingband.com slash 10-step guide, you can download that completely for free. It walks you through the whole process uh, from like writing, arranging, setting up everything, buying the gear, all the way through production, recording, mixing, mastering. Like it just... The whole process is right in front of you if you download that, and it's free. So the selfrecordingband.com slash 10-step guide. And I, yeah, let me know if you find that helpful. All right. Um, yeah. What are we talking about today? Today, we are talking about the five key ingredients of a big and punchy drum sound. All right. This is all you need. Sorry? <laughs> this is all you need. <laughs> this is, exactly. Five. Like, literally, the <laughs> drums are so important to me. That's why I love these episodes, um, because... You can always get away, and I think I said that before on the podcast, you can always kind of get away with a weird guitar tone. You can always say that's on purpose, that's the vibe or whatever, but you can't really get away with shitty drums. If the drums suck, they just suck. So I think yeah. good drum production is such a big part of a great overall production quality that, mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's, it's just one of the, the most important things and one of the easiest things to mess up. I agree. It is, uh, as we've said many times, probably one of the harder things to learn how to engineer well. Um, there's so much that goes into learning to engineer drums and experimenting. There's like the mic placement, there's the phase, there's, you know, all these reflection things and bleed and stuff you got to worry about there. The editing itself is a whole other thing because you've got multi-track editing going on. And uh, there's a lot of margin for error, I guess. Um, so we're not really talking about the nitty gritty techniques in this at all, actually. Yeah. We're talking about the ingredients that come before that. And when you put them together, these should give you a good result. In fact, if you get these together, they'll overpower some of those technical problems. <laughs> yes, I think these are, we did a minimum requirements episode at some points or a couple, like it was two or three episodes actually. Yes, um, it was big. But, and you'll find the links to those in the show notes, by the way. If you go to the selfrecordingband.com slash 73, you'll find the show notes to this episode and um, you'll find the links to those minimum requirements episodes as well. And this episode is sort of 
an extension of that or an addition to that because these are um, the minimum requirements in a way or these are the five things you absolutely don't want to mess up. These are the five things you need to get right. And if you do, the bulk of the of the work is, is is sort of done. Like, of course, you still need, there's a couple more things because drums are so complex. But these five things, you really need to get those right. If you don't, yes. you'll have a problem later in the in the process, definitely. Now, we have a list and it's kind of in order, but it's not necessarily in order. So I wanted to explain what I mean by that before we jump in. Yeah. And I think what I mean is that there's like a minimum tolerance of air kind of thing. Um, and if something on the list is below that tolerance, it starts moving up the list in priority. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm sure we'll give some examples as we go. So this isn't a, a, a tried and true strict list um, or order, I should say. But you'll, you'll get the point. Yeah, absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Okay, so let's start. I guess we both agree that the most important thing is the drummer. Not even the kit, not the, nothing technical, not the mics, no equipment. It's the drummer. Yeah, an example that comes to mind, and I'm sorry I don't know the drummer off the top of my head, but there's a huge song called Stay High by Brittany Howard. I'm sure a lot of our listeners have heard it, but it is not like a big drum kit. Like I actually, I heard that it was a snare drum used as a kick, but the fact is it sounds unbelievable. And you know that there's a great drummer on the other side of that. Yep. <laughs> like the, the drummer is going to decide the vast majority of the result. Without a doubt. Totally. Like the way you hit a drum and the way you like good drummers just get a feel for the kit. They learn how it reacts pretty quickly and they know how to hit it so that it sounds um appropriate for the song. And the way mm -hmm. you hit a drum, how hard you hit it, where exactly you hit it, the angle, um, and of course the groove, the pocket, like all of that is so, so, so important. And it's not just the timing, the groove, it's all it's literally the sound. Like there is a different sound to each drummer, and you can you can easily make that experiment yourself. If you set up a kit in a room and you let two different people play it, it will sound drastically different. Especially yeah. if one of them is a really good drummer and the other is not, there will be a night and day difference. And you can put a really good drummer on a pretty shitty kit, and it will you can still tell that's a great drummer, and it will still sort of sound cool because he'll just or she just hit it right. Yeah, definitely. Uh we've you know you've probably seen it with guitars as well you like guitar sounds great now somebody else is playing it why doesn't it sound the same um benny and i we see this more than most because we've produced a lot of records in our time and we've got a drum tech in and they're hitting the drum and it sounds unbelievable and we're like yes okay let's get the drummer in there to, to play now and it's like what happened yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally <laughs> where did it go like the magic has just totally left the room with our drum tech yeah. um, and you know that's not always the case uh, sometimes it's the other way around and, and you know vice versa but uh, drum techs in, tend to have a very good ability to make a drum sound awesome <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> so and another another proof um, for you that this that you so that you see that this is really um, true is that when people make sample libraries they, you would think that a producer, if if they would make a sample library, they could just hit the drums themselves. Mm -hmm. Like anyone can do that. I could set up a drum kit and I could just hit record, go in there, hit all the drums, record the samples. But most producers uh, hire studio drummers or just great drummers they know from bands they've worked with to come to the studio to record the samples for them. It's just individual hits most of the time. Sometimes they record grooves as well, but even if it's just individual hits, they hire an awesome drummer for that because it just sounds different because they know how to hit the drum so that it sounds the best. Um, yeah. Like You would think that you could put anyone in there and let's just have, have them hit the drums, but you don't. <laughs> it's not the same. Yeah, totally. I remember uh, the drummer in my band, Marcus, um, who also co-hosts my other podcast, he spent a lot of time in, and learning how to hit a drum his snare drum he had great tone just the, the 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 moment we started jamming that was like the first thing i was immediately excited about was like oh my god you're, you sound amazing <laughs> yeah. um, but he it was really loud and and he was having problems with that and i remember he was like i've been practicing getting the same sound in my drum without playing as loud and it, it was like a technique he was learning so that he could specifically have a great sounding snare. He didn't want to lose that, but he needed it to be some, like quieter so that it balanced with different people he played with. And it's like, that's a whole different way of thinking about it that I think most drummers have probably never considered. How can I make the drum sound good while being quieter? Like that's a skill that you might need for a certain live show, a certain venue. 
certain room. Yes, totally. And it's it's really tricky because most of the time, if people play quieter, like the shells, then it also mm-hmm. starts to sound worse. Uh, so yep, I'm exactly. very hesitant to recommend playing it quieter. I'd rather oh, no, find a solution to make the loud <laughs> snare work instead. Like, don't tell people to hit the snare lighter or anything like that. But some people can't do that. Some people c- will sound loud while actually being quiet. Yeah, sorry. I, I specifically meant for, he was learning that as a technique to use in live situations. Yeah. But in the studio, we almost always want that snare popping. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can totally see that. Yeah, it's just yeah, you gotta hear it. If if any, I think everyone who heard a great drummer knows what we're talking about. It gets clear immediately once you hear that. It's it's magic, really. So yeah, the drummer refine your technique. Um, and like honestly, <laughs> it's one of those things where if you really want to make a great record and you are you you have a drummer in the band that is not the best fit for that song or that record. It might be the best decision to program it or to hire a studio drummer. Mm-hmm. It's one of those things I know how difficult it can be because every we all have egos and we all want to be part of the record. But especially with drummers, it's often not the best decision to have the drummer of the band play the parts. And I know that some people will hate that statement and it's like a polar, polarizing thing to say. But it's true. And with many big records, that's the case. Drummers have been replaced often on a record. And in the end, the listener doesn't care. You know, so it's up to you to decide that. I mean, I totally respect if, if you uh, make the decision that whoever is in the band plays the parts. But just know that it might not be the best decision for the record, depending on who the drummer is. Yeah, it's definitely worth the conversation. All right. Um, I think that brings us to number two on our list, which is the tuning and drum heads. Um, I, I guess we kind of mean tuning heads and drums, but for me it's that order it's it's tuning is like my number one heads is my number two and then three would be the shells yeah i agree i agree maybe Absol- <laughs> no, yeah i agree absolutely um the, yeah totally there is no question actually like tuning is the most important thing you can get an amazing sounding tunes out of pretty any kit if you tune it right i was kind of torn between like the heads and the tuning because with very old heads you can't really tune them anymore so mm-hmm. But on the other end, on the other side, if you, um, the other thing is, if you buy new heads and you don't tune them well, it's like also not really good. So those two go together, sort of. But yeah. I agree. The first thing is the tuning, then the head choice, and the fact that you're using new heads, and then uh, um, the the shells. The shells are less important than you think. Many people, when they buy a drum kit or choose one for the recording, they over obsess about like shell materials, different types of wood and metal, and like different types of bearing edges, which are important, of course, and like yes. um, manufacturers and all of that. And everything is sort of important or everything um, has an impact on the sound. But none of these things are nearly as important as the drum heads. Like the majority of the whole drum tone comes from the head. The, the mic is pretty close to the head. And what whatever the drum head does, however it moves and reacts to how you hit it, that's what the mic will pick up. The rest is on top of that, but the drum head is the, the one major thing. Like you can also hear that if you if you just remove a resonant head from a tom, for example, it drastically changes the sound of the whole drum. It's the same shell, same material, but one head is removed. It drastically changes it. If you obviously if you tune it up or tune it down very low, it's different. But also if you like swap out a coated versus a clear head or a single ply versus double ply, it just drastically changes everything. Whereas if you would just change, if you would just switch to a different type of wood, but you put the same um, drum heads on and you kept the tuning sort of the same it would sound pretty similar at least more yep. similar than changing heads totally so I'll, I'll shout out my buddy Lucas McKinnon who owns Silverside Sound the studio down the road from me um, he is a great drum tech and I use him all the time and he has like you know four kits over there or something and we went and grabbed all of his rack toms and gave them all a whack and they were tuned like to the exact note it was so funny they were it, and he didn't even mean to they were just all the exact same note and they sounded totally the same they could have been swapped out between all of the kits and nobody would ever know <laughs> and i've seen drummers kind of be like oh like we're gonna use a different tom on the kit like that that's not part of this kit and it, like, it doesn't matter at all like nope. if you got the a good skin and good tuning on there nobody will it's it's just not an issue <laughs> it's yeah. kind of like electric guitar bodies are really not that important um yeah. like the pickups and 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 good strings and and your gain pretty much 
are, are it. <laughs> Absolutely. I've seen a lot of like Franken kits sort of <laughs> where people put together like five different drum kits and it totally works. Many big mm-hmm. producers do that. I, I've seen tons of pictures of sessions where there's, yeah, there's a drum kit from that kit and then there's there might be some vintage whatever, Slingerland, Tom, or I don't know, like all these, there are these specific things that just work. The same as like a snare drum is always chosen for the song basically it's it's really the 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 snare drum that comes with the kit when you buy it if if it if there's a snare drum in the kit you always oh. choose it and you can do the same with the rest of the kit like some people like yeah as i said like big vintage toms others like the really like um shallow ones or like um re, uh, like you can combine a i don't know a 24 inch kick drum with rather small toms like whatever fits the song can be different manufacturers just make sure you tune it well you put the right skins on and it can totally totally work and it's actually worth experimenting with that i don't think that just using one kit just because that's the easiest thing to do is necessarily the best decision it can be pretty cheap to just rent a kit for a couple of days and see right. if that works better or co- you can combine um elements of it totally totally okay um up next we've got phase now this is the most technical of them because this is like the, you have to learn how to engineer <laughs> and do a good job. Um, and we have episodes where we talk about drum phase. Um, actually, I think one of our first was a pretty big deep dive into phase. Yeah. Um, so if you haven't checked that out, you should absolutely head back there. Uh, I wonder if we should eventually do a refresher on on drum phase, just because we've I think we've gotten better at podcasting. I think too. Like, <laughs> I, I actually thought we should do some of the, like a couple of the earlier episodes, we should maybe... Um, listen to again ourselves and then maybe do uh, an update right. <laughs> yeah but like, well, stay the, tuned for that I, I, assume, I assume the content is still true and relevant uh but it could be presented better maybe but yeah go to that episode listen to that uh, because it really it covers it really well and i don't want to explain that whole concept again because it's a horrible thing to explain on a podcast just nope. know that you need to learn about it there's no way around it you need to learn about phase and i don't know malcolm yes. what is are there maybe some quick tips or th- some things you need to to definitely check? Some things we can't explain on the podcast that are a must um, and should be on every like yeah checklist, basically. I mean, you have to check your bottom snare against your top, and you have to check your overheads against everything else. Like if you do those two, and you get them right, that's that's fantastic. This is the reason this isn't the top of the list is because a good mixer is going to check your face. Um, now you can still screw it up, but a, a good mixer is going to check it. Um, so that you're, you're not totally screwed hopefully. And, uh, and that's another reason to hire a good mixer, um, by the way, yeah, is cause they're going to check your engineering. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then the other reason I didn't think it should go too higher on the list is that a lot of interfaces don't even have phase switches. Um, so people aren't able to really do it on the way in without understanding their DAW further. Um, I agree. No, what, what do you think? Ben? I agree with one exception. Okay. And that is, I think you got to get the overheads right, the overhead balance, because not the, the overheads to the rest of the kit and not like the 100, like the 180 um, face flip. Like if you mm. can't do that, look, that's fine. You can, we can do that in the mix. But if you have a stereo pair of overheads and they are placed in a way that whatever you do, it just doesn't sound right, you're kind of screwed. You, you they're, like your hands are tied because the, Symbols will sound like cheap MP3s if you do it wrong. There will be, mm-hmm. like, you can maybe find a position in the mix later. You can align the track so that the symbols sound better, but then the snare might be out of phase or all the way to the left or right. The, kit, the kick might not be in the center. Um, maybe you can filter it out, maybe not. So there's, you really got to make sure, I think, that whatever you do, that, that the, in most cases at least, that the kick and snare are in the center of the image. And that the that you don't have any major cancellations between the two mics, so that the kick and snare have all the punch, the shells as a whole basically, and that the cymbals sound clear and separate enough. Like depends depends on the on the setup you're using, how separate you want them, or how mm-hmm. wide you want them. But they need to sound clear and not like these weird. I don't know how else to say this this weird washy cheap mp3 thing in the top end that you get when you have phasing issues and comb filters and with the the symbols so i think we can fix a lot of things 
but the overhead balance is really, really important. And it's it's phase yes. or polarity, which is the correct way to say it if it's not 180 degree. But mm-hmm. yeah, you just need to learn about the concept. You just need to be aware of the fact that sound travels and it takes time and it doesn't arrive at the same time at every mic and everything that influences everything <laughs> and changes everything. <laughs> so you got to be aware of that fact. It's just you got to make sure that it all lines up well. Yes. Yeah, we, we can't move your mics. Um, in the mixing phase. That's just, that is where we are stuck. We just can't change where you placed them. Um, and and those overheads are totally crucial. You're right. Yeah. So yeah, drummer, tuning heads, and phase. Now, number four. The room. <laughs> yeah. Now, this one, I think is really actually easier to get right than most people think. Um, like, you got to experiment with where you put the drum kit in the room. You know, you can rig up some cheap DIY treatment. Um, we have a great episode on treatment um, with Yesco Lohan. You got to oh, yeah. check that out. It's amazing. Like, everybody should listen to that. Um, but, you know, if you don't want to listen to that, grab blankets, pillows, mattresses, whatever you need to do if you're having reflection issues. Um, and But drums don't even mind reflections sometimes. They can sound cool. <laughs> yes. You know, so I like rooms are really important, but also really easy to get right. But if you get it wrong, it is just terrible. In fact, if you get it wrong enough, it starts moving up the priority of this list really quick. This is kind of that tolerance thing I was talking about. Um, If, like, for example, your ceilings are really, really, really low, everything is going to be bouncing around that room in such a way that all of your mics are hearing the same information again at different times. And that's when we start getting comb filtering and your entire drum kit now sounds like an MP3 that has been decoded for like the first iPod Nano. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Totally. Okay, so my rule of thumb is I would try to eliminate as much of the early reflections as possible. So I would mm-hmm. go, like you can leave the room open and like, capture some of these reflections. As you said, Malcolm, reflections are not a bad thing per se, but the closest surfaces to the drum kit, like the wall right behind the drum kit or the ceiling right above the drum kit. I would Mm -hmm. treat them. I would put whatever you have, mattresses, blankets. um, In the the, the best case would be some absorbers that you've built or bought that really work. But anything um, that can, yeah, tame those early reflections around the kit, I would do that first. I would get rid of those as much as possible so that you can have a clear, direct, sound in all the close mics that you get a a great stereo image there's no weird reflections from the ceiling because those are what cause the comb filter effect in the in the symbols often like Mm -hmm. it's partly it's the overhead placement but part of it is also what comes back from the ceiling so i definitely want to treat that Uh, and and then the opposite side of the room let's say you have the drum kit against one wall the opposite side of the room if the room is big enough you can leave that open and put a room mic wherever you want like there's no hot rules, and most drums sound pretty cool if there's ambience in the room, even if it's not a really good room. But I would I would avoid the early reflections unless you really know what you do, because those are what, what cause the problems. If the reflections Agreed. are far enough away that our brain can decode it as reverb, like that yeah. we can separate it from the direct, punchy, close mic sound, then it's good. If it's so close that it's happening at the same time, we just hear a weird, phasey drum kit. Exactly. So, yeah, that, yeah, there's one trick with early reflections that you can try and do an A, B, and C if you like it, because I really enjoy it sometimes, especially with drummers who don't hit the snare loud enough. Try, if you, the drum kit is probably sitting on a carpet or some uh, thing on the floor, some soft uh, surface probably so that it doesn't move. Now, if you put a piece of wood or a hi-hat cymbal or anything like that un- right underneath the snare drum so that you get some reflections from the floor it can work. It depends on on the distance. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes you don't really notice the difference. But I've had it where the snare really got a little longer, a little more punchy, a little louder, and it's just a cool effect. So I I saw I saw this um I saw a couple of producers do this and I just tried it at some point and I really believe it makes a difference and I had some some examples where we clearly could tell the AB. So that might be one exception, but other than that I would try to keep the early reflections out of the mics. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's right when you said the general rule of thumb I have is to get rid of early reflections. It's like, that's such a great rule. That's that's what really all our listeners need to know. 
just try and treat the earlier ones and it's probably going to work out great. Again, the room's not that hard. That's why you see in a lot of studios pictures and I, I think you posted or I posted one of you a couple of episodes back where you were at this, this beautiful big um, live room with the really high ceiling and everything. Uh, that's why you see in pictures like that that people often use gobos around the drum kit to mm -hmm. make it a, a little tighter and keep the close mics cleaner and more separate and then but it's still in this big room so any ambience mic or even the overheads you put up there will still have all the room and you can really mix it with the close mics and you have full control versus not having those gobos the when you don't do that like the room is in every mic and you have yep. less control over everything so that's why you see these pictures with the gobos and i think in your picture there was something like this as well yeah exactly yeah there's often like a it's almost like a horseshoe of treatment around the back of the drummer and the reasons behind the back of the drummer is because they're normally that's the the walls that are closest right it's not just because the kit's facing that direction it's because of the the reflections there yeah yeah um yeah okay yeah i think that makes sense right that's rooms <laughs> i think so and and it's one of those things you put it in the notes here that the room can really quickly uh move to the top of the list like if you if you screw it up because there are really really like worst case scenarios that yeah we you can't really solve them in the mix like we both i think we both had to deal with drum kids who were recorded in such bad rooms that you just don't know where to start and how yeah. to deal with it it's like really it can really destroy things and yeah yeah so actually i think maybe we could touch on that the there's almost two scenarios where this happens there is too small and you're getting too many early reflections causing all this comb filtering which we've covered but there's also too echoey <laughs> too live too big even um where it's just so out of control that there's like we have such little ability to change it and and a surprising amount of songs don't need a giant reverb time <laughs> um sound right like where it might it sounds really great when you listen to just drums but it gets messy um in certain songs especially if it's like faster it's almost those extremes are where things get really bad um and again a little treatment goes a long way uh, a, a big room can be awesome if you can get a tighter capture of the close close mics for example just like benny described yeah Or the room next to your room, like as I the, the 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 setup that I have in my in my studio where I have my live room that's really small and it's treated so because I don't want any of those reflections in there. But um, I can open the door and there's a room next mm -hmm. to it that's pretty open and live sounding and tall ceiling and everything. And if I open that room and let some of the ambience in, the room itself sounds different. And I can also put room mics out there and I have full control over the tight kit versus the open big room. And that is pretty cool in the mix because you can create different scenes, textures, and you can just blend it for the whole song, whatever you want. But if you want it really tight, you can have it really tight or you can have it really explosive and with a long decay. So maybe you have something like that. Maybe you can just leave the door open and put mics in the bathroom or whatever. It can, like, right. you know, stuff like that. So, but when in doubt, I would say make it dry and avoid the reflections. We can always add exactly. a little ambience. It's much easier than having to remove the ambience from the giant ballroom that you rented to record your drums in totally yeah that is such a, a good call for diy recording bands it's um it's much easier to solve the not big enough drum sound problem than it is the other way around yeah all right cool all uh, right let's move on to the next step and that's number five, number five. symbols symbols so <laughs> symbols <laughs> symbols are really important uh, like it's it seems weird that it's at the bottom of our list but I think it makes sense most of the time. <laughs> yeah. um, I love having good symbols on a kit. Uh, and and you'll, you'll start as you're recording to figure out what you like and don't like. Um, I think maybe the reason that symbols is lower on the list is that they're circumstantial. You know, a bad symbol can occasionally be the perfect symbol. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, true. Now, uh, symbols are really cheap to rent in Canada. Yeah, so, same here. Uh, like I don't really think there's a good excuse to not have this figured out, um, but just be aware that like some of them just sound so awful that they will eat all of the space in your in your song, and guitars will never have a chance, and your vocals will be miserable. <laughs> yeah, Ex absolutely. And there's so I think to me I I wrote those five things down without an order in mind because there's. Somehow they are all really important to me, but yes, yeah, symbols. Are, I agree that they are probably number five. Just 
as you said, because you can, if with a good drummer in a good room, you can sort of get away with a not absolutely ideal set of cymbals. But the real trashy ones, as you described, the real thick, cheap ones, they are horrible. And cymbals is one of the rare things where I really believe that expensive is better. It's not always the case mm -hmm. with music equipment. Oftentimes you can get really good stuff for not a lot of money, but with cymbals, there is this tendency that like cheap cymbals just don't sound as great. And the, the good ones are all more expensive with the exceptions of like agree. effect symbols. There are cheap chinas or stacks or whatever you can, like stuff like that that's supposed to sound trashy. I've had success with cheap ones there, but crashes, hi-hats, ride cymbals, the cheap ones just suck <laughs> most of the time. Yeah. It's like, yeah. And, and also there is this weird thing where drummers buy the thick, loud cymbals because for some reason they think they need it to because otherwise it doesn't cut through the mix or the live sound or whatever. And when in reality, cymbals are almost never too quiet. They are always the thing that hurts your ears in a small club or even on a big stage, but then yeah. you have overheads so you can boost them if you're, they're too quiet. So cymbals are just never really too quiet or very rarely. And then people buy these thick things because A, they think they cut through more and B, they think they last longer. They are afraid that they have to buy symbols again and again when they break and symbols are expensive. So they buy the thick ones or they see something like rock crash um, or whatever. Mm. And then they think that's the, one, the thing to, to buy. And most of the time these are thick and loud. And the funny thing is they don't last any longer. They often break earlier because the material is yeah. so stiff that it just doesn't give. If you hit it hard and you hit it wrong at the wrong angle, they just immediately crack. They immediately break. And with thinner, better sounding cymbals that you, where you have more control over, they just give a little more. They bend a little and they tend to last longer, actually. They are a little more expensive, but they sound awesome. They, I, th I think they last longer. And also with a lot of manufacturers of cymbals, you get actually a guarantee. Like depending mm. on how they break, if they break, you might even get a replacement for free. Some of the, the right. big manufacturers do that. So I don't think it's worth uh, playing a shitty thick cymbal. Um, yeah, I, I, I just don't think there's any benefit to that. And I don't know why drum companies market those things as like rock cymbals or there are these weird things that yeah. are pretty um, yeah, popular for some reason, but every engineer knows that they suck. It's okay. Here's Here's a little pro tip for you it's actually the opposite with heavy music and the more guitar just walls of guitars are in there that you actually want higher pitched cymbals usually not not exclusively usually because you want them to sit above that stuff right like there's often like you're trying to find a different frequency range for these things um where ironically the times that i want really dark thick cymbals is on like open vintage sounding country stuff where there's like an acoustic guitar <laughs> and, and like there's, there's room for this kind of thing and all of that mud. Um, so, I mean, that's not, not a rule, but I, I agree. I think the marketing's almost backwards. Yeah. I, it's funny because I view it a little differently because I actually like dark symbols and I think that some of the thin ones um, sound pretty, like it depends on the size of the symbols as well. So, okay, so this is a little, there's so yes, many moving parts, so many components, but I, I like... <laughs> Big symbols, like yes, you know, um, twenty inch crashes, Act twenty one inch crashes. Large. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> physically large. Yeah, and then but thin symbols, so yes. they will be explosive. They will be very quick in their response. You have a lot of control over them. You can play them quietly. But if they're big enough, and depending on the material they're made of, they can be dark. And I sort of like that. What I don't like is the thicker symbols. And if they are large too, then that's the worst because then that you're just crazy loud and dark and full and like occupy the whole spectrum. But like, I don't have anything against dark symbols necessarily if they are thin enough so they that they still have the clear top end because then you can filter out the mud if you don't need it and you still have mm -hmm. the clear, fast, quick top end stuff. But it, they won't sound harsh. So there's this weird thing. But I basically agree with everything with everything you said because if you take a thick symbol and you filter out the mud, all you're left with is a very harsh top end and not nothing really fine, right. clear, expensive sounding. So you Both. almost need the, the mud or the mid-range of those symbols to make them sound like anything, basically. And you can't really right. filter it out where with the high-quality thin symbols, you can filter out the mud if needed, and you're still left with an expensive sounding cool top end. 
Thank yeah, you. I think the takeaway of our little nerd out right there that just happened <laughs> is that uh, <laughs> we're trying to choose symbols intentionally, yeah. right? They're they're being chosen chosen based on where we want our guitars and our vocals to sit. Um, and and actually, I, I read like a little thing about when Corn was starting to record again, and they had I can't remember the producer, but he's very good. It sounded awesome, but he was like, "Oh, we got to like really figure this out because your guitars are like octaves below where they usually are. Like like the normal thing won't work, right? We have to consider this." And I was like, "Yes, of course." That's and it sounded good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's always so it always depends on the song, and sometimes even though I just said all that, sometimes I choose very small. I would choose very yep. small crash cymbals because I want them up high and I don't mm -hmm. want any mid-range basically or I want them really explosive. So it's it's just totally depends on the song. My totally. my personal preference tends to go towards bigger, darker cymbals but thin ones but can be the uh, complete opposite if it's appropriate for the song. Yeah, I, I think I, I I fully agree with you. I think I kind of wasn't describing myself very well because it is it's that the top end is nice and yeah. pretty on those symbols, we, like where they are dark, but the the top end is much more pleasant, yeah. and and that sits where I want. Um, yeah, the, if there's anything to have options, it's symbols, you know, and snares. But <laughs> yeah. uh, but like if you rent nice symbols, bring your crap ones along too. You definitely want to have them there. Yeah. Um, I, I always want the more options the better because you'll just switch to another key and all of a sudden your ride is totally not working and you got to throw on your piece of crap one and it just is better you know like better is better absolutely I I bought um, I mean I had a studio kit or I still have the studio kit but the first thing I really invested more money in um, to get really high end stuff was studio cymbals and snares mm. for that reason because as you said that's where you want to have a choice but still if a band were, was like, okay, so we don't have to bring our cymbals because you have great cymbals, I did the same thing that you just suggested. I said, no, bring them. I want to hear them. Maybe it's right for some part or some effect, or I just want to hear how they sound when you play. Maybe they are the yeah. right choice. If we have them, why not try them? And sometimes funny things happen. Sometimes we combined the cymbals. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't work at all, but sometimes it can work. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes we did things like, I remember one production where they had very bright, clear hi-hats that sounded cool, but a little too, in that case, almost too thin, like very precise. And like we wanted more like the trashy grid and mid-range thing. They, they played a lot of open hats as well, and we wanted to, to, yeah, to hear that. So the groove and the overall vibe was more important than the fine details. But then there were some parts in songs where they actually played like 16th, no, uh, 16th notes, and we wanted to hear all the stick detail. So it was this... We were like in between what we should use because they had this clear set of symbols and I had very dark sounding, cool, vibey hats that I really liked. And we tried, we thought like, okay, we can maybe record one part with this and then another part with this. But that really didn't blend really well. It was a re weird transition. So we just ended up combining the hi-hats. We used the top of one set of hi-hats and the bottom of the other. And that was exactly what we needed. So I think we used the darker bottom that made it a little louder and fuller and grittier but we used the finer, um, more expensive sounding top part of it because that gave us the detail in the stick attacks and all that. So sometimes, right. you know, those things happen. Yeah, absolutely. That's fantastic. Um, so I guess quickly to recap, there was the drummer, there was the tuning slash drum heads, there was the phase, I'm getting that right. And then there was the room and, you know, your reflections. And then it was symbols. So one, two, three, four, five. Now, I think this isn't on our outline, but I think it's worth noting what isn't on there. We didn't mention your uh, microphones. Yeah. We didn't mention any outboard compressors or EQs or fancy hardware or preamps or interface. <laughs> no tape machine was included in this. <laughs> nope. Nope. You don't have to have a Neve console in front of you. Nope. Um, no runner delivering coffee, although that does help. That would be an easy six. Yeah, <laughs> I was about to say, I think that helps. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, just drawing attention to that. Like, those, everything we mentioned comes vastly before the gear. Yeah, absolutely. Totally. And I think you can take some of what you learned today and apply it to other instruments as well, because obviously, mm -hmm. like, drum, drum heads and tuning will not apply to anything else, but the drummer well, or tuning. the guitar, sorry. <laughs> Tuning does. Tuning, do, tuning does. All, all right, yeah. Tuning absolutely does. Uh, but the drummer, 
um, it's the same thing with a guitar player. And like you can't really swap out the vocalist most of the time, so you're kind of stuck there. <laughs> That's the bad part. But um, <laughs> yeah, but all the other instruments, if like it, it's just worth thinking about who's going to play it. Have they practiced enough? Do you have maybe a little more time to go back and practice a little more? Like I don't say you have to swap out people all the time, but just make sure you're prepared. And um, you can apply things that we said today to other instruments as well. The tuning is very Definitely. important. The person playing the instrument is very important. The room is very important. A loud phase, guitar amp still important. In, right in front of an untreated wall can be a nightmare as well. It's the same thing. Same, vocals really suffer from a bad room. So the same principles apply. What we, whatever we said about the early reflections and, and keeping the opposite side of the room open, you can apply that to almost any instrument. So, yeah. It's just, uh, yeah, this was even a very if you don't much, record yeah. drums, I think you could get something out of this episode. Definitely. Yeah, it, this was very much a, like, it all starts at the source episode. We pretty much, we broke down what we're talking about and that equals, that's the source. The source has to sound how we want it. Totally, totally. And what I would recommend to wrap this up, um, I would recommend if you have a good drum VST, a virtual drum instrument, I would recommend programming all of your parts and then recording the real kit and trying to match how, what the the VST sounds like if you like that sound or not match but just try to just compare and learn from that just analyze yes. what the good samples sound like because they've been done very carefully usually with great kits great drummers in a great room great tuning great mics great everything and you if you analyze those virtual drum kits, if you just load a MIDI loop and like one that's well programmed and you listen to that and you solo the individual channels and you see what the overheads sound like, how they're balanced, how they're panned, what the room sounds like, what the close mics sound like, all of that. If you analyze that and compare it to your drum recordings, um, you can learn a lot from that. And I would recommend using uh, samples that are unprocessed and natural so that you have a fair comparison. But that is a an exercise that I really enjoyed doing and that I learned a lot of because, yeah, it can be frustrating at first, but it, there comes a point where it's really fun to switch to the virtual kit and be like, hmm, mine is pretty good as well. <laughs> it's like not that right. much better. And th that's very cool if you get to that point. Definitely, definitely. Cool. Awesome. That's it. Thank you yeah. for listening. Hopefully you enjoyed that. <laughs> See you next week. Bye. Bye.